Well, hello there, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor. I'm your host, producer, creator, and all-around jack-of-all-trades when it comes to doing this show together, episode 20 here already. Hope you're enjoying them, and thank you very much for tuning in. Let me get right to some of the top stories that I'm following for this episode. Now, the first one is an interesting one. It's a coalition called the E-Drive Coalition, and it's a group of organizations and auto manufacturers and other companies involved in the electric vehicle marketplace, including GM, Tesla, and Nissan. And they're banding together to form this coalition with their sole purpose of changing the U.S. federal tax credit program. Right now, as you know, it's capped at 200,000 sales in the U.S., and once a manufacturer hits that, it goes bye-bye in a phased-out manner. Well, these organizations are looking to extend that or actually drop the cap completely, so open it up and probably extend the program for another four to five years. That's uh, kind of what I've heard. So if you're interested in learning more, it's I think it's a good thing. Uh, to continue to help spur EV adoption and you want to find out more about it, you can go to their website, which is at uh, www.evdrivecoalition.com forward slash home and get more information. And if it's they're looking for people to write to their Congress, uh, man or Congresswoman or other uh, members of legislative bodies, then uh, do what you like on that. And hopefully they'll succeed. I'd like to see the U.S. Uh, tax credit uh, be extended for a while because EV adoption has really taken off. And, uh, you know, when uh, more manufacturers start hitting those levels as they come up with more models, they will. It'd be nice to extend that for a little longer. One of the things driving, of course, adoption is manufacturers that are putting more autos, more electric vehicles out in the marketplace for consumers to choose from. And Kia is no exception. They've done a few models now. And when I talked about Kia, I'm going to always lump in kind of Hyundai into this because they are, in fact, the same company uh, when you look at a bottom line. Well, Kia has come out with an announcement that they see profitability in electric cars in as little as uh, two to three years, which is an outstanding statement to make, considering that Tesla took quite a while before they're starting to see profitability just now, just this year in 2018. I think to date Tesla's only had about three profitable quarters in their history, but somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. So Kia is saying that within about three years, they should see profitability on their uh, EV models. And that includes the Soul and the uh, E-Nero, which I think the E-Nero is going to be a a really big hit. Now, they're only talking about building 30,000 of these at around a 30K or so pound price. And I just remember seeing an article recently that the pricing has gone up a bit in the UK or in Europe on these cars. So I think that's going to help drive profit margins, obviously, a little sooner for Kia and Hyundai. But they want to sell about 30,000 units. That is kind of low. I really hope that uh, that they, uh, as I've said on many shows, that Kia and Hyundai kind of really ramp up production and get a lot more going. Now, there could be things like battery supplier shortages and components and stuff that could get into the mix. I get it. I understand. But I hope the intent for them is to really spool up faster and get these things going so that they can achieve profitability a lot faster. But this is encouraging news because all the other companies that are still kind of mucking around with uh, with EVs and uh, and and what they plan, what they what their plans are for EVs might see this as a good sign that, hey, if we get in now, profitability is going to be a little bit quicker than we first would imagine. And it does make sense from a company like Kia or others that have a massive infrastructure in place from a manufacturing and from a parts and from a people perspective, they could spin up and get profitability faster. Remember, Elon talked about these economies of scale for many years, and he's only starting to reap the rewards of that in the last uh, year as the Model 3 gets cranked out in high volume to be ordered to get those profits going. So it does take time. But these other car manufacturers like Honda, Toyota, GM, Ford, Chrysler, uh, uh, Nissan, and all these others have large infrastructures that can, and could get pretty almost instantaneous economies of scale going once they get the batteries sorted out, obviously. Uh, and, you know, VW is looking to do that. Then I'll have more about them at the end of this show or later on this show. So good on uh, good on them. And let's keep our eyes on Kia Hyundai. Now, on that profitability stance, of course, Opal is a company that GM sold off. I don't know why, but GM is GM. Uh, remember, folks, they were bailed out, but that's another story. Uh, so Opal is announcing they're doing really well, that they're seeing they're seeing profitability in their electrification lineups as well. Um, they are part of the PSA group, and they reported a profit of just over 500 million pounds, sorry, euros, or almost 600 million US, depending on what day in the exchange rate, in the first six months of 2018. Uh, their strategy is to go full el- all electrification, kind of like what Volvo's talked about uh, when we heard about them a year 
or so ago. They want to do the same thing. They also go by, um, Opal goes by the Vauxhall brand, if you're familiar with that. And, and then by um, 2021, they have want to have, a, sorry, by 2020, they want to have another four uh, electrified plugins and or an all electric car. They have something that they're calling the all electric Corsa, and they're going to have something called the Grandland X plug-in hybrid based on some new platforms that PSA is developing. And again, by 2024, all their platforms are going to be electrified in some manner. So good for them. Uh, just nice to see that organizations are starting to see what the reality of the automotive landscape is, that it is changing. You know, the tsunami has come and gone and that hockey stick is happening. Whether you like it or not, you need to get into the game. Now, a company that has seen the light and has got into the game is Jaguar, and they've reported it really, really strong sales for October for the I-Pace, the all-electric I-Pace in a car that I reviewed and I, I totally enamored with. Uh, you know, it's not cheap, but it's that's a Jaguar. Uh, they've uh, sold just over uh, 1,200 I-Paces in October. That brings their year to date to about 2,500, just a little under that. Not bad since it's only been out for a couple of months, but they do have a lot of orders. Now remember folks, a couple things about Jaguar. They're a niche brand, okay? They only produce 120, 150,000 cars globally. That's all they do. They're not building 5 million a year like Toyota, Nissan, and some of the other guys, or millions of cars a year. They are a niche player and they stay in their box and they're quite happy with doing that. So for them to pump out, you know, 15 to 25,000 I-Paces within that, uh, uh, that, that 120, 150,000 dollar output, 150,000 unit range, excuse me, is quite phenomenal. So they're going big time into this. And remember also that they're one of the few manufacturers that have designed a vehicle, specifically an all electric battery vehicle from the ground up. This is an all new design. So whether you like the appearance of it or whether you don't like the appearance of it, because I'm seeing all kinds of comments and articles, uh, the rear looks terrible. It looks, uh, I don't know, all kinds of different descriptions. Hey, you know, kudos to Jaguar for doing this and whether the efficiency is not as good as it should be, it really doesn't matter. They're going to, they're going to sell to their marketplace. People who buy Jaguars love Jaguars in general and are repeat buyers and the brand, you know, there's a lot of baby boomers like myself that are getting older and that are looking to, uh, you know, maybe have the affordability to get into a more luxury car market. And, you know, when you got, I wouldn't compare it to an X, but when you look at the model S versus the I pace, there's a lot of nice things that the I pace has that the S does it and vice versa. So definitely good for consumer choice in that marketplace. The prediction is that Jaguar should be able to pump up um, output of the I-Pace to about 2,000 units a month very soon. So good for them and keep your eyes on the I-Pace. And if anybody has got one on order, uh, especially here in North America, and they're starting to slowly get delivered out here, I'd love to hear from you and let me know what your thoughts are on that. Now I'm going to switch to Tesla and talk about the Model 3 that's been in the news. Well, Model 3 is always in the news at some form or fashion. You can't go one day without saying 10, at least 10 uh, headlines in any EV website about the Model 3. But regardless of that, uh, I want to thank one of my viewers, Matthias Just from Germany, who sent me an email uh, letting me know that uh, he got notification that the Model 3 is coming to Germany for him to look, touch, f sit in, feel, smell, all that good stuff. Now, I thought it was an email that kind of announced that they're going to open the design studio for orders. So I jumped the gun a little bit there. But um, yeah, needless, uh, Model 3s have already, I'm sure you've read articles by now that they're already in Europe. They're getting into showrooms as we speak and don't know if they're doing test drives yet, but people are seeing them, which is great. That's what Tesla wants and that's what we people want to see. Now, one of the cool things about Europe if you haven't heard, uh, is that they're going to come out with CCS charging ports uh, as well within the European spec Model 3. So that means you'll get both opportunity to charge via the Tesla proprietary charger, level uh, 1, 2, or 3, a supercharger being level 3, or a CCS. And I think it's a level 2 and level 3 CCS, but I'm not 100% sure on, on, the, on the level 3 CCS portion. It looks like it to me. Uh, so that's excellent. And what that means is that uh, for European customers, they'll have access to over 5,000, almost 6,000 more charging points than they would have without CCS being part of that car. So it's just going to make it much more viable you for travel. Now, obviously, the Model 3 has great range, and I won't go into the details, but it just gives you more options, and that's good for customers of uh, Tesla and the Model 3. There will be a, an adapter coming down to pipe for Model S and X relatively quickly for CCS uh, for Europe specs as well at about 500 euros or pounds. I think it's euros is the number that I saw for that. So that's good. Um, so anybody who's really excited about getting the Model 3 that's coming to 11 countries uh, relatively soon, let me know. And if you get a chance to see one, 
Um, if you actually get a chance to drive one, I'd love to hear from you, for my European viewers. But uh, let me know what your thoughts are. You know, now that you've been waiting so long for you to actually go to a showroom and physically see it, let me know if that changes your mind at all, good or bad. I'm 99.9% .9 sure everybody who's got a reservations are going to be just enamored with the car. There's no doubt in my mind. But I'd love to hear your feedback and just send it to me either email in the comments. Also on the Model 3, there's reports about uh, the rear-wheel drive versions, the regenerative braking uh, significantly being reduced when you switch tires. And these are specifically to winter tires. We're now getting an early winter here in North America. Two days ago in Toronto, we got about six inches of snow, which is way early for us. So I can tell you climate change is real, that's for sure. But you, a lot of Tesla owners in North America are reporting up to a 50% drop in regen capabilities uh, just for swapping tires. So Tesla's aware of this. It may be an OTA fix. That'll be the come down the pipe. We'll have to wait and see. But if you are experiencing this, I'd love to hear from you on some of your viewpoints. It, now, folks, it's not uncommon for batteries to lose regenerative properties, so regenerative um, uh, capabilities in cooler temperatures. I know with my Nissan, with my e-pedal, that I'm seeing probably about a 20-30% drop. Uh, it's hard to put a number on that, but uh, I am noticing and I'm seeing through Leafs by Pro, I'm looking at some of the data, that I am seeing a drop in regenerative capabilities because the battery's colder. Remember, um, cold batteries do take a lot longer to charge, uh, even with DC fast charging stations. So that has to be something you have to think about when you're doing winter traveling. Not only the range drop that you get in general, but the charging will be longer uh, regardless of what type of charger it is, just because cold batteries take a while. So it's not uncommon to have a, a less regenerative braking in the winter time, in the colder seasons, uh, just that this particular case with Tesla and the Model 3 seems extreme. So Tesla, look, Tesla is looking into it, to my understanding, and hopefully they will have a fix really soon. Back to Hyundai for a sec. They've announced at a Brazilian car show that they're uh, coming out with a new CUV, a compact utility vehicle, if I remember my acronyms properly. It's called the Saga. There's an interesting name. I love it. And uh, there's not a lot of specs about this car other than the fact that it should be loaded with everything that the Kona has. So it should have a 64 kilowatt hour battery and 150 kilowatt electric motor. Um, and that according to some Brazil articles that this car should be ready, this vehicle should be ready, uh, start coming to the local markets as early as next year. Uh, now, this could just be a South American or a Brazilian market. I'm not sure if it's coming to the rest of the world. I'll have to keep an eye on it. But uh, if anybody knows anything more than I do, please let me know. And uh, I think it'll do quite well with a range of about uh, 470 kilometers, uh, almost 300 mile range, uh, and uh, zero to 80 recharge in 54 minutes, which is your standard pretty pretty cool fast stuff. So anybody who's got uh, some more information to send me or share on that, let me know. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about Volkswagen. There's a few things I want to talk about in this segment regarding Volkswagen. First is an, uh, an announcement that I saw earlier this week that I'm very, very excited about. It, and I, I couldn't have planned this better, folks. My last show, my soapbox show, when I talked about the affordability aspect of EVs needing to be there. And then a week or so later, this article comes up with, from VW saying that they want to sell, or they plan to sell a subcompact electric crossover so a small electric, uh, maybe SUV type uh, CUV vehicle for about 21,000 euro. I'll take this as euro numbers uh, since it's coming, I believe, from VW announcements in Germany. Uh, sorry, 21,000 US, 18,000 euros. That is So that exceeds my expectations of what I said on the last show about getting it to under 30,000, maybe 28, 25,000 would be great. So if they want to come out with something like that, all, everything that Volkswagen is doing is going to be based on their modular um, vehicle platform, which is the MEB, as they call it. It's a brand new platform that they're building. They've invested, I talked about the battery investments they made, $5 billion in, in battery supplier lineups. They've already, of course, we've talked about many shows. You've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of PR and press about the, the new ID platform, their Cross, the Buzz, and the Vision, the Cross Buzz and Vision, if I got that right. Now they also uh, are going to call this uh, this small hatchback kind of CUV the ID Nero, I believe. And they're also want to come out with a super affordable midsize sedan and a station wagon. 
Now, how many viewers out there know when I say station wagon, what that means? I'm sure there's a few people going, oh, I remember those days. I drove a 75 Lincoln station wagon, massive boat. Man, was it fun. I tell you that uh, for many years. Uh, so anyway, station wagon. So they want to, they really want to get into the affordability aspect. And I think that that's great. Now, none of this is a done deal, folks. VW has been spouting a lot of, you know, intel, a lot of information over the last few months. And the talk is cheap. We really want to start seeing some action. However, I do see things happening. You know, they're making these deals, they're priming plants, they're looking at retooling, they're looking at personnel shuffling to keep jobs and migrate them into another platform, another lines and so forth. So they are doing things. Now, I don't think this $21,000, 1,000 euro or 18, sorry, 21,000 uh, US dollar car will be a 500 mile range car. No way. I don't even think it'll be anything, you know, higher than a 60 kilowatt hour. I'd be surprised if it's even that probably a 40 or 40 ish variant, 42 or something like that variant for that price point. But that's, that's good enough. Get something like a, what a Nissan Leaf can do today. The, the 40 kilowatt hour version, 150 miles, you know, 240, 250 kilometer range in decent weather. That's good enough for a large swath of population and get something like that into people's hands for, 21,000 US dollars, let's say 27, 28,000 dollars, or even 29,995 Canadian, let's say, decently equipped. Man, that thing will, will, you know, you're really closing that gap and cost parity is pretty well out the window at that point. So good on VW to look to really look at doing this. They want to sell 200,000 of this, just these economy type EVs in the, not, in the not so distant future, you know, around 2022, 2024 timeframe. So it's not that far out there. We're, you know, a month away almost from 2019. So things are happening pretty fast. Um, so that's excellent news from Volkswagen that they've announced they want to focus on that. Now, all these numbers are talking about, they want to build 200,000 of these and they have millions and millions of these other cars. They, got, they need to get batteries from somewhere. So they've inked a deal with SK Innovation. They're a Korean-based battery supplier and they're they're kind of one of the main players out there next to Panasonic, uh, LG Chem, Samsung, and CATL are the other battery manufacturers or suppliers for automotive. And they're part of that. So Volkswagen has inked a deal that they're going to get these guys to help supply them with batteries for the North American market and also be a failover or a, a tier two supplier or a sub supplier for the European spec cars. I think Volkswagen is going with um, LG Chem, if I'm not mistaken, in Europe as their primary source. But it's always good to have a backup, but don't have all your eggs in one basket approach. As we've seen with Hyundai as an example where they're having problems getting Ionics out the door and so forth. Uh, so the framework of EW, of Volkswagen is this roadmap E, as they call it, and where the ID platforms come into play. So enable to support that, you need to have the plants, as I mentioned, the personnel, the suppliers, including most critically battery suppliers. So it's good that they think this other deal. VUW wants to bring 50 new full electric. That's 50 full electric, not just uh, electrified vehicles, but 100% battery only electric models into the roads by 2025. That's only six years away, folks, and they want to bring five zero models to the marketplace. So that's pretty aggressive. And let's hope that they can do that. They need a lot of battery capacity. They need probably about 150 gigawatt hours of battery to be able to equip all those cars and get them out the door. But uh, let's say, and in fact, I said LG Chem earlier on, it's actually Samsung. Uh, actually, no, they have done deals both with, Samsung, with LG Chem and Samsung as well for the Euro base. So they're spreading their their uh, needs for electrification out, which is the smart way to do it. Don't have just one supplier. Now, Tesla's different because they own part of that and it's a co-own, co-share situation where they're managing that whole, as much of the supply chain as they, they, they can. And that's what Tesla likes to do. But for the other guys, partner, get the leaders in those, but spread it out, you know, and, uh, you know, Apple does that, right? For some other parts too, they're, they're, they know the game and that's the way to do it when you're building mass market products. And lastly, on Volkswagen, so what does all this mean, folks? It means that Volkswagen, you know, claims that they want to build 50 million, five zero again, million electric cars using this new MEB chassis. So they're going all in onto this program uh, with the with this chassis. Um, you know, it's a theoretical long term goal. It doesn't say that they want to do it in five years or 10 years or 20 years. There's no number as far as attainment for this goal. But it's nice that they, they at least want to throw it out there and set some sort of a target. And I'm sure that they'll 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 um, you know view that target down into more specific over time as they get ramped up.
But it's nice that, you know, they're stepping out and saying, this is what we want to do. To them, this is one of their, this is probably the most important project that VW has in its company's history. This, this electric drive matrix, this MEB modular platform that they're bringing. And they're going to put all these, base all these new vehicles on that platform. This is very significant news, folks. Say what you want to say about Dieselgate and all this other crap that VW has been through. I get it. It's not very cool. But remember, it's a small portion, small number number of, of people within that organization that had a hand in Dieselgate versus the, the, the tens and hundreds of thousands of people that didn't. So give them a break from that perspective. They're trying to right that ship and turn it around, do a 180 and get get out of uh, get better with the world. And, and this is one step to do that. Um, so, you know, by 2022 alone, they're going to have uh, gained 27 models worldwide, including that cool looking buzz van that uh, we all saw. Uh, that uh, had reminiscence of uh, California beaches all over it. So, uh, you know, that's what I want to add. There's all, some other specs that they're claiming, but, you know, it's all it's all claimed until we see something. I'm hoping that next year is going to be a pivotal year for Volkswagen that we'll actually start seeing not just concept cars, but some very close pre-production uh, models that are going to be showing up in car shows. That means that they're pretty close to actually pulling, you know, doing something real. So, um, this is all talk until we start seeing that. So if people at Volkswagen, I know I've got a couple of friends here in Volkswagen, Canada that once in a while check out the show. I'd love to hear from you if you've got something to add on that. And I hope to see you at the car show and I hope to see some more significance from Volkswagen next year. One of my final articles, sometimes I like to leave on a little bit of a different note, talk about electric boats and all kinds of other things. Well, uh, I want to bring in South America. I don't talk about them too much. And a country that's near and dear to my heart, Ecuador. My lovely wife is from Ecuador and we have lots of family down there. But there's one city called Guayaquil. It's a coastal city and they are looking to change their entire bus fleet to 100% electric. They've put an order in to BYD, a Chinese bus manufacturer, for uh, 20 of their 12 meters. 80 passenger buses their fleet isn't that big it's only it's only 20 buses for the the main uh, metro city area where they run the transit system but this designation will give them the will allow them to establish them as being the first electric fleet in the country from a transit authority perspective, an all-electric fleet. So there are companies that talked about London and others that are that are electrifying their fleets, but they're so massive, they're doing it in chunks, right? They're doing more popular routes and then slowly going to expand out. Well, in Guayaquil's case, they've only got, you know, they only need 20 buses or so. They can do it in one shot and they want to do it by March of next year. And here we are in November and they want to get this thing going. So they're building infrastructure to charge these buses as well as getting the buses and, and all the, the tools in place to get that. They did a five-month pilot. Uh, already, which they uh, they figured out that most of the buses only run about 250 kilometers a day on average, and they move around 70 to 75,000 people within that daytime period. So that's going to be great for Guayaquil because what it's going to do is not only give them the title as being the first city, uh, at least in South America, to electrify a, a full transit fleet. Um, but it's, they're also actually going to look to spin this off into taxis as well and get electrified taxi fleets going, which is great because we're seeing that in a lot of countries. It's a good, good move. The big, big benefit to Guayaquil is two, twofold. One, they're going to save about three million bucks U.S. Excuse me, Ecuador is a U.S. dollar based economy. So everything there is U.S. So they're going to save about three million bucks in diesel fuel alone just from the buses. And they're going to save, avoid, sorry, almost 13 tons of CO2 emanating from these currently black polluting diesel buses that you see driving around there. So that's fantastic because at the end of the day, folks, that's what we need to get to. We need to get those tailpipes out of here and we need to get some clean uh, clean zero emission vehicles. So congratulations uh, for uh, Guayaquil, muy bien, and uh, let's, uh, I'm, hopefully I'll get a chance to go down there next year and maybe visit the Galapagos and go through Guayaquil and uh, at some point. But uh, if there are, have any viewers that are seeing this transition and that get a chance to ride on these new buses, please send me an email or a comment. I'd love to hear from you. And to wrap up the show, I just wanted to bring this uh, to your to your notification. If you weren't aware of it already, Trevor, uh, of course, my partner in past on the Model Three Owners Club show that uh, we got started in this whole electrification YouTube stuff that we do and he's been really focusing on the, the the tesla side which is what his passion is well he put out a video thanking everybody because he's achieved a huge milestone with his tesla referrals of getting more than enough needed to get a roadster yes folks a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar us three hundred thirty three thousand 
something like that Canadian dollar sports car that he's going to get at some point from Tesla in the next couple of years. I think they're planning on shipping the Roadsters in 2020 at some point, so it should happen there. So I put a nice thank you uh, a video together for that. I encourage you to check it out. And that's great. You know, Trevor's out there evangelizing um, the EV world and doing his thing, uh, Tesla. And, you know, whether it's a Tesla, a Nissan, as I said before, it doesn't matter. Let's just get people into cars and consumer-based transport and even uh, and even some commercial like buses and stuff where we can get rid of tailpipes. That's the whole it's the whole name of what we do, folks. So congratulations, Trevor. All the best. And I know that Bev is going to look just awesome in my prediction of a red awesomeness. So good, good on you, Trev. Congratulations. Right. That wraps up the show for today. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I encourage you to reach out to me by email. And uh, you can do that at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. I read everything. I respond to everything. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you don't want to, e and if you want to send me an audio email or through through uh, email or a video, I put it on the show. Put it part of the mailbag segment. If you got a question or comment, you can follow me on Twitter. I do c try to keep up to date with Twitter. My handle is at EV Rev Show. If you want to follow me there, um, I try to just keep it related to the EV news and marketplaces. I don't get too personal on Twitter from for this particular handle because it's there for a reason. Keep you guys and gals informed of what's going on and uh, some of the stuff that I'm doing as well. So. A for that thank you very much for subscribing i finally said that word right because i always skip through that word subscribing to my youtube channel and if you haven't i'd love it if you would just press the appropriate button and you will be subscribed to my channel you click the bell and you'll get automatic notifications so thank you very much for all of my subscribers and if you again are interested please do so uh, i also run audio podcasts and i uh, create and put those together for something different than these news base and, and the in the car review type shows that i do and something you can listen to in your car or at home or if you want to fall asleep too if i help you fall asleep great that's okay <laughs> anything that's positive that's all right just don't fall asleep while you're driving folks um so it's all good uh, so you can listen to my audio podcast. Just search EV Revolution Show under iTunes, uh, through iTunes or your favorite podcast app. If you uh, are iOS, if you're Android, uh, you can look at Google Play and uh, podcast apps that support that. I'm on Google Play. TuneIn Radio as well. I've been able to get on Spotify as well. I'm now on. And just a couple of days ago, I finally got on Stitcher. And thank you for a, a, f a viewer that sent me a note saying, hey, you should get on Stitcher. It's a great thing as well. So I'm now, you can find my EV Revolution Show audio podcast on Stitcher check them out and I'll be looking to do another one in the next couple of weeks as well now that I figured out this WebEx thing um, I can actually start talking to people anywhere in the world theoretically sometimes there might be some lag so hopefully you're enjoying some of those WebEx shows I know the audio audio can be a little bit more challenging it's not as good as being in person when I have my nice mics to set up and, uh, and a nice studio to record in but it gives me the ability to talk to people that I can't just travel to or maybe our paths won't cross locally so hopefully you're enjoying that if you have some topics that you want to talk about want me to cover or somebody you want me to talk about let me know through email or through through the comments and uh one last plug again for the audio podcast is i did do a nice episode with spencer here about winter driving techniques it's a look for audio episode number six we talk all about winter driving and the impacts as i mentioned some of the regen earlier that happens there's a lot more stuff that you should know about in winter driving and ev uh, go have a listen to that it was a really great show and i thank spencer for that and finally as always, a heartfelt thanks to my Patreon supporters. Um, you guys are just, I'm just humbled every every single time that I, that I get emails and notifications from Patreon. I, I'm just super, super uh, stoked by that. Thank you very much. It just helps me to defray some of my costs. Uh, look, I, I've out-of-pocketed so much, folks, for, for these shows when, when I started with Trevor, even doing them, you know, traveling here and there and gear and all this stuff. You, you guys know how it is. I mean, stuff can be inexpensive, but you want to get better and time. You know, there's a lot of time to put into this, not only the filming, but the editing, the thinking, you know, the researching, uh, planning for other stuff. All this kind of stuff is happening. So I appreciate anything that you can. If you feel like contributing, you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show. Check it out. Even a dollar a month would help. It does, that's my minimum. There, there's, you know, I don't have really any kind of thank you gifts if you do a certain pledge. I didn't want to kind of do these level pledges. I just wanted to open it up for anybody and feel you give what you feel you want to anything is appreciated and thank you very much again for uh, the patreon supporters and that's it for the show then fast and furious i hope everybody enjoyed it uh everybody stay safe out there and again until next time we'll see you later